Hi, everyone. Um, as I was introduced by Sergio, my name is Kelsey Peterson. Um, I work for a company called Stitchfix, which is not yet available here in the United States or here in Singapore. Um, we're based in the United States. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about how we simulate incidences in production on our software engineering teams. So this all started um, about a year and a half ago. Um, it was 3 a.m. I was actually on my first on-call rotation. I had just started working at Stitch Fix a month or so beforehand. Um, and like all engineers, we are responsible for supporting the applications that we built. Um, and so it was 3 a.m. I was getting paged. Um, it's basically every software engineer's worst nightmare. Um, I, was, I was awoken in the middle of the night. My alarm was going off on my phone. So I roll out of bed, I open my computer, um, I see through our logs that our application isn't loading. Um, I specifically work on the team that our stylus, um, or on the team that we build software for our stylus. Um, so stylus are an integral part of the way that Stitch Fix works. Um, and stylus um, style at all parts of the day. It's a remote job. And so unlike other software systems, um, we're responsible for keeping it up um, not only during business hours, but um, in the middle of the night as well, which didn't bode well for me this night as I was getting paged. And so 10 minutes after kind of searching through the logs and graphs, um, I see on an application dashboard that we're experiencing an outage due to a dependent service being down. And so this is a really common situation for engineers. We're expected to support applications that we work on, but we don't necessarily feel prepared to do so. We infrequently get time to practice and hone our response tactics since we only really respond to incidences during the real time, which can often occur at an irregular cadence or in the middle of the night. Um, and so oftentimes, I think we feel like we don't know how to respond. This often can make us feel confused, unprepared, possibly even incompetent at our jobs, um, which can lead to stress and anxiety. And so we're neither uh, ready nor practiced to solve these incidences effectively. And so I think there's three key parts to incident response that I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, first, um, as you can tell in this anecdote, I wasn't actually even sure how the app was reacting during this incident. Um, I wasn't really sure where to look for metrics. Um, we have dashboards like a lot of companies, um, but oftentimes it can be hard to figure out uh, where to find that information that's actually going to be able to tell you something. And third, which was the most anxiety inducing, um, I had no idea how to resolve the issue and no one else was awake to help me. Um, and so a lot of stress um, and time lost during incident response comes from lack of clarity. Um, and lack of practice in these three parts of incident response. If we're expected to resolve an issue that we've never seen before or that we infrequently experience, it's going to be a lot more challenging for us as software engineers to do so, since we don't have the knowledge or tools to resolve the incident. And so right now, the common strategy, I think, for most teams, and honestly, most teams even at Stitch Fix um, right now, is very reactive. Where we're responding to incidences in real time. Um, it's very hectic. Um, no one really has a good plan on how to respond. But ultimately, what I'm going to be talking about today is that we want our team and our incident response to be more proactive, and with us planning and practicing incident response. And so I think it's interesting to kind of think about how being on call or incident response isn't specific to engineering at all. Um, there's a lot of other professions um, that handle incidences on a daily basis. Um, so this photo up here, you can see firefighters. Firefighters, obviously, that's their main job, responding to incidences where uh, it's a life or death situation. Uh, firefighters go through months and months of training to even be hired on the job, um, and then continue to go through training throughout their career. Another great example is doctors. So doctors, as most people know, go through years of med school and residency, and similarly continue to train and practice while they're on their job. And so these examples may be a little bit different, because for the most part, they're dealing with life or death situations. But I think the kind of overall theme is the same. 
they're put in these positions uh, in their job where they're expected to respond in, a, in an effective and efficient manner, and they're given the tools and knowledge to do so. But I think if we think about engineering, most of us have probably gone through uh, some form of training or we've taught ourselves um, a lot of what we know. But I doubt many of us have spent time working on practicing incident response, either at school or during your day job. And for most of us, practicing incident response has been an afterthought in support, a second tier to maybe new shiny features being built. But today we're going to be talking about making practicing incident response a priority within your team um, and how to do so to support building more resilient systems. So why are we as engineers unprepared for incidences? As you've seen other professions like firefighters and doctors train and practice incident response in very different ways. And since we as engineers typically only use real life scenarios instead of creating our own practice simulations, this means, like I said earlier, that these real life incidences are often unpredictable and poorly timed for learnings, like the 3 a.m. wake up call I experienced just a few months into my job. And as we all know, 3 a.m. is not very conducive to learning. So we need a system in place to be able to practice at times during our work day uh, so these simulated incidences in practice are actually conducive to learning. And this is because we at Stitch Fix ultimate be ultimately believe that practice enables effective incident response. We want people to feel prepared and practiced while supporting the applications they own. But to take a step back, I think it's interesting to think about why don't we do this already? You're probably like, oh, this sounds great, but a lot of us don't practice this on a day-to-day -day basis. I think first, a lot of people are like, oh, this is going to take a ton of infrastructure and time and energy to be able to implement a system like this. And we're not all DevOps engineers. Like I said at the beginning, I'm, confession, not a DevOps engineer, I'm a software engineer. But hopefully I'll be able, be able to show you that this is fairly easy to implement. I think another key point is that other features are often prioritized. So it's easy for business, uh, business partners to prioritize other new things that are actually going to, that the users are actually going to see over working on more DevOps chaos engineering features like this. And third is that the learnings can often be on unknown. So like, what are we actually going to learn from this and what, how is it going to benefit the business? And so with this approach, we're actively practicing and causing outages to our system to learn and grow from it. We will eventually feel more proactive than reactive and more prepared to handle incidences that occur within the applications we support. So how can we practice incident response? Um, what is this going to look like? And so when I was introduced, uh, Sergio was talking about chaos engineering. Um, and it seemed like a lot of you guys have already heard of chaos engineering, which is really cool. And so to give a little background kind of on this project at Stitch Fix, um, one, the chaos engineering was really spearheaded at Netflix um, a handful of years ago um, by now one of my current coworkers at Stitch Fix. Um, his name was Bruce Wong, and he led the chaos team there. Uh, and so he has come to Stitch Fix, um, and this is actually the first project where we're implementing chaos engineering at Stitch Fix. There are a few differences, I think, between Netflix and Stitch Fix. Um, Netflix had a pretty big DevOps team, Stitch Fix does not. And so as you'll see today, um, and I think the really cool part about this is that the engineers, the software engineers, are really owning chaos engineering at Stitch Fix. Uh, this really stems also, too, from kind of what Ken was talking about. We're aligned around business function, and we have specific product teams. And so I work on the product team that supports styling. And so it can really be captured just in that styling uh, product unit. And so thinking about chaos engineering, what does chaos engineering really buy us? So we really want to think about here kind of the objective of chaos engineering and the result. Um, and for the rest of the talk, um, chaos engineering is really just synonymous with simulating incidences in production. So our objective here is to inject failure into our system, and our result or our goal is to build more resilient systems through learning about our systems and documenting those learnings. 
So first, our objective. Where do we want to inject failure into our system? This is a key issue when thinking about simulating these incidences in production. What do we want to simulate? This will determine ultimately where we want to start injecting failure. But unfortunately for a lot of you guys sitting in the room, this is not a cookie cutter solution. And I think what I'm ultimately going to show you today is fairly specific to Stitch Fix. But hopefully I can show you that the general concepts and the result are ultimately going to be the same. So for most applications, there's a handful of common issues. And I'm going to kind of go through a handful of them. Um, and then the example is going to be specific to Stitch Fix. But hopefully this is beneficial in kind of thinking about where you can inject chaos engineering into your own team and applications. So first is database failure. Uh, so where do you get and store your data? Uh, most people's applications are heavily dependent on databases. Um, you might have Postgres, Mongo, um, or a different type of data store like Redis or something like that. And so where you're getting the data and how that's being brought into your system, if that's failing or if it's timing out, how is that actually going to affect your users and affect what's actually showing on your page? Second, uh, flaky containers and hosts. Um, so we use uh, Docker at Stitch Fix. Uh, we have dozens of containers that run our applications in production. And so if one container goes down, or if all of the containers go down, how does that affect the stylists who are trying to load our software? Third is external systems. So a lot of teams use external systems for like payment or customer support <coughs> applications instead of building them out building them out internally. So for example, at Stitch Fix, we use uh, Braintree for payment systems and Zendesk uh, for customer support. And so when these systems go down, our uh, applications are unable to uh, support those parts of the flow. So they're unable to support payments or uh, customer support tickets. Um, and then fourth is internal systems. So um, as Ken was also talking about as well, uh, we use a microservice-based architecture. So um, our apps interact with services to uh, get the data to load into our application. And that's, this is a little bit specific to Stitch Fix, um, but the general um, kind of uh, architecture is a very common practice nowadays um, in software. So in thinking about which simulation your team should prioritize first, I think it can sometimes be a challenging question. It can feel very overwhelming. There's a lot of points of failure often within our systems. And there can be a lot of opinions about where to start. Um, but I think we should be breaking it down in, into two key areas to analyze. First, um, what is the frequency in which incidences are occurring in these parts of your system? And what is the impact? Um, so a high frequency uh, situation, or a high frequency incident, but is having low impact might not be a great place to start. Um, and similarly, if an uh, incident is not happening that frequently but has high impact, uh, that also might not be a great place to start because you're not going to actually be dealing with it that much um, while on support. So it's really about finding that middle ground between frequency and impact. And so at Stitch Fix, I went through these four. Uh, we decided to start with our first simulation with internal services. Uh, this is because uh, in internal services, as Ken said, sometimes it can be a murder or mystery in figuring out what's going on. Um, and since we're kind of in the process of moving to a microservice-based architecture, um, it still can sometimes be a little bit flaky or unstable. Um, so this is where a lot of our support issues are currently stemming from. Uh, one point to note, so I did give this talk on uh, Tuesday. And one really interesting comment was, what data did you use to support this decision? Uh, true confessions, we actually didn't use any data. But I would, <laughs> I would actually really uh, suggest, and I think we have only implemented this one scenario that I'm going to go through. But I think in future scenarios, thinking about what data do you have about how long does it take to respond to certain incidences, and uh, being able to roll up and sum the number of incidences that you're either getting paged for, or something like that, is a really uh, great place to start. Um, and I think what we'll probably use as a team moving forward as well. So now that we've decided that we want to simulate incidents or simulate failure from one of our internal services at Stitch Fix, where are we actually going to inject that failure within our system? Technically speaking, how is this going to look? 
So the way that our services interact with our applications in this microservice-based architecture is through HTTP requests, where the app is asking the service for data and the service is returning, uh, returning that data. And so for normal status response codes, we'll get a 200 meeting the status was successful. Uh, but for unsuccessful ones, we'll obviously get a 500. And so this, the layer between the application and the service is called middleware. Middleware is where we're actually going to simulate that failure from the service. And what we're, actually, what we're going to be doing is we're just going to be overriding the 200 to a 500, the status code that represents failure. And so at Stitch Fix, we use Ruby on Rails for our uh, backend uh, language. Ruby, uh, the Ruby specific middleware is called Faraday middleware, which is shown up here. It's just its GitHub repo. Uh, but Faraday is actually really similar to other middleware solutions. It's an HTTP client library that uses the concept of rack middleware when processing the request response cycle. And what Faraday is going to help us do here today is it allows us to hook into the res request response and alter the response we get back. <coughs> and so in this scenario, the details are we're going to be replacing that successful status code with a 500. And so don't be too concerned if you're not familiar with Ruby, um, but this is a, I'm going to go through a bit of code just to kind of show you exactly uh, what we're doing here. Uh, first, we want to start off by creating this new Faraday connection object. This, option take, or this object takes an options hash where we can pass in things like URL and request options. We aren't really doing anything yet in the connection object um, where you can see in the do block up on the screen, yet setting up the standard configuration. Um, so what's up there so far is we want to return JSON. Um, the instrumentation is basically just recording info about each request, and we're just using the default adapter. So next, uh, we want to be able to write our own middleware class. Here we're going to be calling it response modifier. Uh, we want to name the method within the response modifier call, um, since all middleware um, are classes that implement a call instance method. So what we're doing here within the on-call uh, or on-complete method is we're able to alter the response um, and we're able to alter the status code. And this is where we're actually, within our code, altering the uh, status code from 200 to 500. And then at the very bottom, you can see we're actually just registering this custom middleware as a response modifier. And so as you can probably tell so far, the solution is very simple. And this ultimately um, is, I think, the value of implementing something like this within our system. It actually is not taking developers that much time. So once we create the custom middleware class, um, we call the class um, right here within our Faraday object. Uh, we, the response modifier, you can see, once we call it, the status code is then going to be changed to 500 on all requests. So this is really cool because regardless of what we get back, we force our applications to think, while it's not true, that the internal service re returned a failure. And so we could stop right there. We've actually already injected failure into our system and say we're done, which is crazy, like I was saying, because it was really n like very, very little code. But what would happen here is if we actually launched this into production, it would affect all of our users, which is not something we really want um, and not something the business would be very happy about. Um, stylists would be unable to style, Stitch Fix would not make any money, and our stock price would probably plummet. <laughs> um, so obviously, that's not, this is not the end state here. Uh, what we really want to do now is think about how can we toggle this on for certain users within our system. And so in order for the simulation to only affect a fraction of our users, we want to create a new config variable to pass into the HTTP request object. Here you can see we're instantiating a very important kitten object and passing in the config variables. Uh, you're familiar with the URL and endpoint that I pointed out in the Faraday object um, as options we are passing in. But we also want to define a new config variable to pass in as well. So here we want to define a new response modifier that defaults to false for most stylists. Um, so most stylists are going to have this set to false. 
um, which ultimately means that they're not going to be part of this failure simulation. So they're still going to be able to do their job um, 100%. But we do want to be able to pass this in true for certain users. And so up here I represent that um, I don't have all the code, but there we use a feature flag system. And so you can just assume that here um, we're instanti instantiating this object based off of me loading the application. And so for here, we're going to be setting this for true for me as a member of the simulation. So what we can do here now within um, our Faraday uh, connection is we're able to alter the response for specific users. So we pass in the config response modifier that we defined in the last slide, and it's set to true. And so this is a key part of scenarios at Stitch Fix. Um, but could be, this is a key part of scenarios at Stitch Fix because we're able to um, ultimately not affect all of our users, but this is something that each business might want to think differently about. So for some use cases, even uh, where when Bruce worked at Netflix, they would chaos monkey everything and it would go down for everyone. Um, so that, alt that decision is based off of what your different business scenarios are. Uh, but for us at Stitch Fix, at this point, uh, we're still fairly early on and we feel like creating these simulations and learning from a subset of our users is a ton of information for us to learn at this point. So the priority here, as you can see, is to focus on the minimum viable solution first. It can be often easy to get carried away. I'm sure we know that as engineers here in the room. <laughs> it's often hard to really pinpoint one specific small unit that you can ship and get into production at first. Uh, but I think the important thing here is once you get one simulation into production, you can start learning from that and iterating on it and learning a ton. So ultimately, you don't want to spend a ton of time implementing just one simulation. The other point here, too, is that once you start learning from that simulation, you may be able to um, fix bugs in your code base or fix the issues that the services are having or fix the way that um, the UI is representing bad data. And through that, you can learn and iterate, iterate, and the simulation might not even be important anymore. And that's honestly actually the goal. So that would be great. <coughs> So that leads me into how can we learn from our simulations. I showed this slide at the beginning of my presentation. What is the purpose of simulating incidences? So we've covered how do we inject this failure into our system, which was our objective. But what is this result? We want to build more resilient systems. And that, through that, uh, we're ultimately going to make stronger software. So how do we do that? How do we build more resilient systems from simulated incidences? This is all from learning as a result from our simulations. And how do those learnings help us build more resilient systems? What have we learned? So there's three essential areas of learning from our simulations. This may look familiar from the beginning of my presentation. But first is app impact, second is metrics, and third is runbooks. So first, application impact. We want to think about this as a decision tree. First, how does the simulation actually impact uh, the application? How does the simulation cause the application not to load? Does the simulation cause client data not to load? Does it cause inventory not to load? You probably get the picture. And this is, on, this is going to vary significantly company by company since all of our software is doing different things. But we ultimately want to understand the ways that the simulation is affecting the users. And once we learn these things, we can use this information and knowledge to guide our metrics and runbooks, the, the second and third parts of our learning. So second, we want to learn more about our metrics from our simulations. So when the application doesn't load in the simulation, do our metrics and alerts even tell us that? If not, that's a really great place to start. The way that we implemented this at Stitch Fix is uh, we were able to tag the users who are part of our simulation um, with who are part of our simulation. So within our monitoring dashboards, we were able to only view metrics for those users, which was a really great way to be able to silo out which metrics were um, erroring out uh, for these users. It provides us clear visibility into the metrics that would occur during these real life versions of these simulations. And it's really important for engineers to see which parts of the applications aren't performing at a normal level. 
And metrics are really essential for doing that. So third, we want to use our learnings from our understandings um, with the application impact in metrics to be able to document this and to run books and documentation articles. So for instances that occur, do engineers understand the context of the issue at hand? If not, are there documents to be able to gain context? Do engineers have the steps to be able to resolve the issue? Once we practice and practice, we'll be, ab we'll be able to gain clarity on how to actually resolve it. Do the run books have linked alerts to them? So um, we at Stitch Fix, when we get an alert, um, we're in the process of implementing uh, run books or steps to be able to resolve the issue directly from that alert. So we don't spend time um, digging through our uh, wiki page on GitHub and trying to dig through and find relevant information. It's already at our fingertips. And once we get to the run books, are they clear? Do they contain relevant information? And so run books are a really key way to spreading knowledge that we've learned through practicing these simulations to all members of the team to help them have the tools and knowledge to be able to resolve the incident efficiently. So ultimately, the goal from simulating these incidences in production is to gain these learnings to build more resilient systems and be more prepared for when incidences occur. So we've learned quite a few things today. Uh, we learned that, um, and I think maybe this isn't necessarily a learning, but maybe reinforcing something that we already know, is that practice can, make, can lead to us feeling more prepared as engineers and ultimately make us feel more efficient um, at resolving these issues. Second is that we want to focus our efforts on scenarios or simulations with high impact and frequency. So thinking about which MVP scenario you work on first, those are the two things that you want to be thinking about, impact and frequency. And fourth, I didn't really get to this this much in a talk today, but once you build the MVP solution, how can you build on that? What does that look like? And how can you extend these simulations to capture more of the incidences that could possibly occur uh, in production? And then finally, the result is that we want to have more resilient systems which makes our team, our company, and users that much happy using our software. And that's the ultimate result. Thank you. Engineering, is it a way to test system resilience and reliability, like failover testing? Why is it in production as it is a proactive approach? Why cannot it be in non-prod environment? The question was asked by Venkat Adanki. Ooh, great question. Um, so why do we do chaos engineering in production rather than like a test or staging environment? Um, so. There's a few kind of points to this. I think um, at Stitch Fix, we don't really use um, a staging environment that frequently. And so the way that we test a lot of different new features is we roll them behind a feature flag and do it in production. And so I think that's just kind of the standard that we, uh, or the standard practice that we use at Stitch Fix. Um, I think if Bruce was here, what Bruce would say is that um, if we're not doing it in production, then it's not going to feel like a real life incident. Um, and we want it to be as realistic as possible. Um, and so if you're running it in a test environment or a staging environment, you're not, you're not ultimately getting the same type of practice um, that you would be um, in production. So I would say those are the kind of two main points for why we do it in production. Thank you. And the second question is, why developing middleware manually for simulations instead of using existing tool sets like the Simian Army? Uh, so I'm not familiar with the Simian Army, but I can say that you can see up on the board that it actually wasn't that much code. And so um, I think typically a practice that we use at Stitch Fix is we try not to pull in external systems or tools um, unless it's something that we can't build internally. And so I think 
uh, for the purposes of this, we didn't feel like uh, it was necessary, um, and it would just add extra complexity um, for what we were trying to do. Oh, OK, thank you. Thank you for all the answers. Thank you for the audience for asking these questions. And I've seen that you already start tagging your name, and there's comments. So let's encourage that and keep voting and make sure that we continue this conversation in the open spaces. And with that, I'd like you uh, to give a round of applauses to Kelsey for the